Hello and welcome to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran, matriculating you into Ghana's foremost developmental program running since 2008. Springboard is brought to you by the Springboard Racial Foundation and proudly sponsored by the enterprise group MTN Pulse UMB Bank with media support from the multimedia group and the graphic business. So, Today we break from our top 10 series to get into what we call the business school right here in your virtual university. And guess what? Our topic for today is one you would most likely want to hear over and over again. Leading in uncertain times. I don't know which industry you are in, but the times are definitely uncertain. My guest for today absolutely qualified to help us break this subject down. CEO of Busara Africa, Taka Awari. Taka, good to see you. I'm happy to be here, likewise. Yes. Good to see you. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you too, yes. yes. Year, we haven't seen each other this year. But you're looking absolutely great. And Thank you. you seem to have Thank some you. fire in your bones. Oh, particularly when I'm coming to talk about leadership. Yeah, that's, <laughs> how, how, how is the book doing? Leadership in Very Africa well. Redefined. Very well. Untold stories. Very well. So I keep hearing about stories from... You know, from across the continent, people reading the book saying it's easy to understand, they can relate to it, it speaks to them. But I think it's also inspiring them to believe that indeed we can have a different narrative about leadership in Africa, which is what the book is designed to do. I tell you what, my, that, that is the exact reason why I think we should do a separate session on sure. the book. Because you will typically find people running down what we have. Yes. And... Anytime we do springboard, people say you want to talk, you're always talking about the positives, you're always talking about what is possible. Why don't you criticize what is there? I say, listen, there are enough people doing that. Thank you. We need help. Thank you. Thank we need you. help by pointing the light to what yes. is working. Yes, and and it's it's not just important for inspiration's sake, huh? but I find that the way you define yourself huh, and your group as Africans, huh, and particularly your nature of leadership determines the standard to which you aspire to. Mm -hmm. So if our narrative on leadership is that, oh, you know, we don't have good leaders, as for us Africans, we can't lead ourselves, then what you find is Africans, we're not inspiring to those high levels. And you find other people don't do the same. Eh? When Americans start to talk about their leadership, they'll be bringing out George Washington, the best of who they are. Eh? But yet somehow we're talking about the worst of who we are. So I think I fully agree with you. It's important to speak of those positive examples. Others are doing enough on the negative. Indeed, yes. indeed. Yes. indeed. Okay. So let's do a show um, on the book. We'll find the appropriate Please. platform to do a full show, a full Please. hour on the I book. Please, I would love that. And I would do, love that. Uh, we, have been, we have been champions of promoting African writing. We think that we don't do enough of it in our yes. part of the continent. So our yes. story doesn't get told yes. by ourselves. Yes. And our children get to read what others are saying. Yes. And what you see yes. really, really, really impacts who you become. So anything that African, could... authentic, oh, I love that. I that is real, that. we want to push I it as hard love as we that. can. Also, because we find many leaders, what they're struggling with is that often if you pick up many business books about leadership, Often the context you can see is the global north, <laughs> yes. corporate, not often the real challenges that leaders are dealing with here. So we need a lot more material to guide the leaders on this continent who are dealing with some real challenges like the ones we'll talk about. So today. let's go straight to the challenges yes. and with your kind permission, let me not use an African example. Let me use a global north example, <laughs> but let me yes, quote, <laughs> yeah, you know, so let me quote from this article on how disruption is defining or redefining leadership by Michael R. Wade. And he says, imagine that you are overseeing a retail banking outlet in the financial services company. In addition to all the normal challenges you face, a new raft of challenges is confronting you. Number one, competition. Your main lines of business, savings accounts, loans, mortgages, are being attacked by well-capitalized fintechs. Number two, new digital giants like Apple, Google, Alibaba, and Amazon are starting to muscle into your territory. Number three, 
technologies. You're trying to get your head around potentially disruptive new technologies like blockchain and machine learning. Number four, staffing. You want to be digital, but you are having trouble recruiting the right staff or right talent. And then number five, speed is important, but your systems are not just up to it and are slowing you down. Yes. Taka, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's very interesting. And I know you cited someone from the Global North and he gave an example of a typical company in the Global North. But it's so interesting is that we could replicate those same examples right here in Ghana and the continent globally. Yeah? So constantly we're finding, so you could be running a business here in Ghana. All of a sudden you need to import certain products. You hear about, oh, there's something happening in Ukraine. You're thinking, ah, those Europeans are doing their thing. All of a sudden you start to realize, wait a minute, it's actually affecting supply chains. And all of a sudden I can't get the products that I'm looking for. So what we're finding is that the types of challenges you just described are happening to lead, leaders are facing globally. Yeah? The reality is now we're leading in a space of deep uncertainty. Back to your question, what do you do? I read the other day a framework for leading in uncertainty that I thought was so useful, so simple, yet so deep that I thought I would share with your audience. And it's around four key principles for leading in uncertainty. Let me share the four and then I'll go through each of them. Sure. Inform, number one. Two, connect. Three, guide. And four, unite. Inform, connect, guide, and unite. So let me go through each of them. Sure. And give some concrete examples in terms of how this may work. Huh? The first one is around inform. And what is that really about? It's about in times of uncertainty or in times of change, as a leader, you need to know there is no such thing as under communicating. Hmm? Mm. I've worked with clients before who are going through change processes because of uncertainty. They're trying to readjust, restructure to meet changing contexts and markets. And they will say, ah, but we told our staff, we told them that this and this is happening. We told them, we don't understand why people are still anxious. We don't understand why there's still a rumor mill about what's happening. We had three all staff meetings. We had this community hall. And now we say, you think you've shared enough. Huh? You think you've informed enough. But what happens in moments of uncertainty is employees, staff, shareholders, people get very nervous. They get anxious. They're unsure what's happening. And when they don't know, they fill in the blanks. And often they may fill in the blanks with worst case scenarios. Why? Fear, and you know, we, we get into what I call the amygdala hijacks. Huh? It's the older part of our brain hmm, that immediately sees unknown situations as a threat. And that was really with, you know, as human beings, we've evolved that way because if that part of our brain had not, um, had not grown, we would find a tiger coming out of the bush and would say, oh, must be all is well. And you find, so the ones that were hyper vigilant were the human beings that evolved. So we always have that part of us huh? that immediately we step onto the unknown. We start to get afraid, anxious and think, what does this mean for me? Now, if you're a leader of a team, an organization, or company, you need to acknowledge that that's what's happening and don't allow people to fill in the gaps with the worst case scenario. So your job is to communicate, communicate, and communicate again. Not in one way, but in so many different ways. I like that part. I presume that the reason why you all think that you have communicated and yet the rumors and the filling of the blanks persists is because you probably have chosen one way of communication that doesn't reach yes. a certain segment yes. of your public. Yes. Or you use a certain language. Like I've seen leaders who do this. They will have... Um, They'll call a town hall meeting, all staff meeting to say, okay, you people have heard this is the particular threat coming. And then they will use such complicated business or serious brothel that really 
some of the real staff who are most threatened, huh? you know, the frontline staff, some of the most junior staff who think I'm easily disposable, you know, those are often the ones who feel very vulnerable during times of change. Huh? So those ones will think, okay, you called us, but I didn't really understand what you meant by that. So even the you language. So you spent the whole hour the time, the time preparing hour. serious slides to say this is the business growth targets. These are the they are simply not understanding. Taka, interestingly, we had this strategy session in, in one of our companies years ago, trying to distill the values of the company, not based on what was written in some books, but what we were living. And it was a print company. And we had spent two days with consultants trying to figure it out. And in the closing session, we had done everything, but the values were not that clear. Mm. So in the closing session, we had all the staff come in, including the apprentices in the printing press. Okay. And we were just wrapping up to close and then come back some other time to do the values. And this yes. guy kept looking at us, this very young apprentice, not formally educated, kept yes. looking at us and wondering, why should this be such a big deal that we should come back? So he looked at her beside and said, can I ask a question? And he spoke in vernacular and said, yes. as for printing, it must be done on time. And we wrote promptness. Then he said, it must be done in a way that is very much according to what the client wants. We wrote accuracy. Look then he ended that. by saying, and it isn't that when you do it today, then tomorrow you will spoil it. Then we wrote consistency. Look End of that. case. There was, no need, there was no need for <laughs> there was no need for another session. This was done by an apprentice. See. So you are saying that listen, you can do all the slides and all the big stuff. If you don't get down to that person who will it. understand it and the most vulnerable, that's it. You would have communicated that's based it. on what you think. That's but it. the message wouldn't go all the way it down. It wouldn't go all the way down. Taka, let's go to the second one. Okay. Connect is very much tied to the first one around I informing. I huh? I now now it's, it's making sense. Huh? Yeah. Because I think this is another thing that we're doing as leaders in times of uncertainty. We're recognizing, and again, this as you're informing, you're recognizing that often people are not listening logically. Again, it's, it's a very, it, it becomes an emotional issue. You're really tapping into your emotional intelligence as a leader. So what you're seeking to do is to connect with people and what they're feeling, the emotions they're, um, they're experiencing during periods of uncertainty to build trust. What you need to be as a leader in a moment of uncertainty is a trustworthy leader. Mm -hmm. And again, if I just if you think of it very simply in terms of imagine you're in a boat, in a ship, in a storm, what do you want to have? You want to have a captain that you can trust who will navigate you safely through the storm. How is trust developed? Two things. Huh? Competence and character. Mm. And Stephen Covey, who wrote The Speed of Trust, he's that. the one, yeah, isn't it? And remember, he breaks it down into those two things. Huh? Because often trust is such a big thing if you break it down. So let's, let's talk about the two elements. Huh? So competence is about displaying to the one who you want to have trust in you that you have the skills, experience, and know-how to achieve a particular task, huh? to get a certain thing done. So I may trust you 100%, Albert, when it comes to leadership, when it comes to inspiring others. I won't trust you to cut my hair. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> See? So trust, you have to get very specific. What do I trust you? So for leaders, in this context, is about trusting that you have the skills, knowledge, and experience to navigate through uncertainty. So that's the first thing, the competence. The second is character. And I would say competence is, is required, but character is absolutely essential. So character is about displaying alignment with stated values. That's your character. So I claim to be somebody who is fair. I demonstrate that in my decision making. I claim to be somebody who's inclusive. I demonstrate that in my decision making. Yeah? So those two elements build trust. Yeah? Now, in a context of uncertainty, part of the character element is showing that I empathize, I get you, I'm also feeling the anxiety showing. So it's the human side 
of connecting with other human beings during, during uncertainty. So it's really as a leader, how do you demonstrate your own vulnerability? Talking about that, mm -hmm. the traditional construct oh, yes. is that exactly. the leader oh, must show themselves to be oh, unflinching yes. Yes. and strong. Yes. And you are saying that vulnerability for lack of a better word, yes. sells or yes. appeals yes. to people or attracts. Yes. Help me to understand the vulnerability of the leader as an asset. Okay. And, and let me say this. This is a reflection of some of the major shifts over the last two decades in terms of the nature of leadership found to be effective. Hmm? 20, 30 years ago, or maybe 50 years ago, the type of leadership that was seen to be effective was the all-powerful, strong, patriarchal leader, never phased, never sheds a tear. But what we're finding increasingly is that employees, staff want to be led by people who seem like other human beings mm. to them. But, and let me say there's a huge but, it's a fine balance. It's a fine balance between showing vulnerability to say, I too am afraid. I too am not sure. But showing at the same time that kind of hopefulness and inner resilience. Mm -hmm. So it's getting, it's navigating just that right balance to show, yes, I can relate to you because I too am human. And actually it takes courage to say I'm afraid. And this is also an interesting thing in our African context, huh? because I still think on the continent, huh? we still have this vision mm -hmm. or this image of the all-powerful, all-strong, always leader. Let me borrow from the writings about the life of Nelson Mandela. I'm starting yes. in Africa this time. Yes, <laughs> yes that's good. <laughs> and the story told about a small plane in which Mandela was sitting together with a small oh, crew of yes. people yes. and they hit turbulence yes. and this old man sat in the plane so relaxed everyone was frenetic about what to do and by some miracle maybe you trusted the pilot but by yes. some miracle yes. Yes. The, the plane landed safely and then the old man let out a sigh of relief and said that was scary and then they asked him but were you scared he says Absolutely. So you are saying that demonstrate that you are scared, yes. but at the same time, demonstrate that inner resilience that tells people while we are scared, exactly. let's soldier on and get it done. Exactly. And therefore you are modeling. And this is a key thing about leadership. You're constantly modeling for others how to navigate uncertainty. And navigating the model you're showing is that it's okay to own up to the fact that fear is present. Because what is courage? It's not acting without fear, it's acting in spite of fear. So it's saying, I own up to the fact that I am afraid, but I'm not letting fear dictate how we as an organization, as a company, navigate through this uncertainty. You know what I hate about people like you? Yes, <laughs> tell me. You make it sound so real and so natural to do the right thing. So the next um, logical question is, so why don't we do it? <laughs> do you know, do you know, just yesterday I posted something on um, LinkedIn. Huh? African Development Bank is about to do a study around what do we need to do to ensure that growth in Africa is a lot more inclusive and sustainable. And I said, no, 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 no. We don't need any more studies about what to do. We know what to do. The big question I would love to study is why don't we do what we know to do. Before you do the study, just from your own work over the years, yes. why? I know. This, this is what's emerging for me. Huh? Okay. To be able to do what you know needs to be done. All these things I've just listed, the vulnerability, da, 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 none of this is, it's not rocket science. You need to first and foremost manage yourself. And I've always said, you can't lead another until you lead yourself. 
Now, managing yourself requires a lot of inner work that you need to do consistently over a period of time. And I think somehow our culture, our educational backgrounds and curriculum has not given many of us as Africans the tools to do the inner work. Let me give you a very concrete example. Huh? To show vulnerability, the example that we just gave, means that I need to manage the voice in my head that's saying, oh no, I'm going to look weak. They're not going to trust me. They're just going to think I'm not serious. You know that whole imposter syndrome that I find only women own up to it, but I know men are walking around with that same imposter Some. syndrome. Some. <laughs> Some. <laughs> So you, you have to manage that voice in your head because if you don't manage it, then you will show a lot of bravado, which you don't really feel. Huh? So those little things like how do I manage the voice in my head that often may come from insecurity, my ego, hmm? that's what get limiting beliefs, that's what gets in the way. And working on that takes years, literally years of constant self-development, personal development, a lot of the work that you all do here. And folks are too focused on doing the external work. Let me go get my fifth business degree. Let me go get my PhD. But that investment in the inner work is the gap I see in leadership development, which would enable people to do what they know they should be doing. Do you think that we've gotten it wrong in several instances in terms of the education required to be successful as leaders in business, in government, in, in the areas that we aspire to lead in? You yeah. talked about getting that third degree. Yes. Talk to the average person and the assumption is that the more we pile them on, the more we are. We are, we are focused in the right direction. Yes. Do you think that we get it wrong in that, in that way? It's never black or white. Huh? We're not necessarily focusing on the right things. Huh? So, so we're getting it somewhere right, but there is a gap. And this is the gap. Huh? Often a lot of the skills that come out as a result of doing the inner work are what we often call the soft skills. And I think these are not soft skills. These are actually power skills. Mm. Empathy, emotional intelligence, um, ability to have difficult conversations, ability to speak truth to power. They're calling all of these soft skills, but this is usually the tough stuff around leadership, which often in our leadership development, we're not investing enough in. And I would love to see how many business school programs that are focused on leadership development actually invest in this. And often I will say to folks, if you want to develop your leadership, but you want a whole bunch of knowledge and, you know, then you can go to the business schools. If you want to work on yourselves, then come to us at Busara Africa, because often that's what we do. And I think coaching, and this is where we are beginning to get it right in leadership development, is that coaching is the tool, the support that helps leaders to really look in the mirror and say, okay, I know I'm supposed to be doing this. How am I getting in my own way? Why am I not doing what I'm supposed to be doing? So coaching to me, executive coaching, is an opening, a tool, a wonderful means of supporting leaders huh, to really be what they need to be. So yes, pursue those additional degrees, but also tilt a bit more yes. towards what you call power skills. You see, yes. calling them soft skills is uh, not, they're not soft. True, they're no, not they're not soft. There's skills. nothing soft about I those skills. This. Nothing soft about those skills. Try having a hard, difficult conversation with someone to create a culture of accountability. And you tell me that's a soft skill? And it's not soft. It's not soft. This <laughs> is springboard of virtual university, and this is not soft. This is, <laughs> this is a hard a stuff. power conversation with yes. Taka Awari. <laughs> CEO of Busara Africa, she's an executive coach, she's a management consultant and an author of a book that I'm recommending with all my heart, Leadership in Africa Redefined, Untold Stories. Get that book for the simple reason that our little contribution to magnifying the African leadership conversation or narrative must be amplified by your efforts and my efforts so that Africa's story 
can be told by authentic Africans with real intent. Is that a nice description? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I loved yeah, it. Yeah, I I loved thank it. you. I love that plan. I, I should thank record you. it. Thank you. Record <laughs> it. So, so far, Taka has been saying a few things. One about the African narrative, of course, driven by the book. The second thing is about universality of the issues you face as a leader. She says, this is, this is not even a Western, a, a, a North or Western conversation. It's the same across the world. Uncertainty, disruption in your business model is being felt across board. And then we settled on the framework for today's conversation. Four things that a leader must do in the midst of uncertainty. And the first one was to inform, and she says, there's nothing like saying you have done enough information you must keep doing it in different styles and different languages the fourth point still on the framework is connect and she says that you must connect with people as somebody who is real and somebody they can trust in their most vulnerable moment and that requires competence and character she says the competence required by character is non-negotiable. Then she goes on to divert from the framework to talk about vulnerability. And she says, listen, the major shift in the construct of leadership is from that all encompassing powerful person to a person who is real, who feels the same fears and pain, but has the inner resilience to lead people out of the uncertainty. And she also adds some two things I would like to hammer on, the first being managing yourself and that's the reason why we don't do what you're supposed to do if you can't manage yourself you can't manage everyone and very often the things you go through in our background militate against that kind of self-management the last point before this break is about power skills don't even call them soft skills how dare you these are power skills you need and so in addition to all the mbas you're acquiring she says invest in being coached to get those critical skills you need to be able to lead. Let's go for a break. When we come back, let's delve a bit more into the two other parts of the framework to guide and to unite. And I promise you there will be some detours. But by the time we land, you will see, wow, like Mandela, <laughs> what a journey. Please don't go away. <laughs> Well, now that we're all here, um, I want to start by saying what a difficult year it has been for all of us. But then there's also a lot to be grateful for. You know, like when I bumped my car into a taxi right at our junction, and the insurance company paid my claims the very same day. And remember the surprise cash bonus we received for our funeral finance plan. That is what sponsored our trip to the beach. <laughs> and the song we sang all the way to Pram Pram. I'm also grateful that every passing year brings me closer to enjoying the retirement benefits I have contributed so much to. And how since I started working from home after the COVID pandemic, I've been taking better care of myself. Even my doctor can attest to that. Speaking of that, I'm very grateful to the team at Transitions for giving Grandpa a befitting send-off. Well, on a happier note, I am grateful to have found an affordable office space to rent at Advantage Place. Enterprise, your advantage.
Welcome back to Springboard of Virtual University and to this amazing conversation with Takaori. Springboard is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and proudly sponsored by the Enterprise Group MTN Pulse UMB Bank with media support from the multimedia group and the graphic business. And talking about the graphic business on Tuesday on page 18, the full transcript of Tata's thoughts captured block by block for your learning and for your sharing with your friends, loved one. Also find it on springboard.com.gh. I'm loving what you're seeing, what you're seeing, Taka, and mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at the base of it all, the, the, the untold story, to borrow from your book, the untold story this conversation confirms is that we have authentic African thought that can be universally consumed and that can contribute to leadership discourse and and thank you for what you do i truly thank truly you. appreciate thank you. appreciate um, um what you do let me let me borrow from one of my, my previous conversations when it comes to leadership one, one of the resources that we've used quite a bit here is my great friend um professor pk richardson of the manchester yes, Business he's School. amazing absolutely fantastic person we yes. love him yet we've yes. been with him for over a decade okay and in one of our conversations he said something that was on one part fulfilling and on one part scary mm. and just to corroborate your point about not just learning and acquiring degrees but also coaching yourself through different means mm. and he says on one of the trips to ghana he started to play with someone and mm -hmm. he just happened to mention comfort and i mm -hmm. and somebody said to him 95 percent of what i know in my practice and work uh -huh. was learned from the virtual university springboard the virtual university so Taka, tell me about the point about informal learning or alternative learning and its contribution mm. So yes, because I'll say I'll call it alternative learning, maybe not so much informal learning, because it, it reflects a lot of the way, for instance, we at Bosara do our leadership development. What we're finding is that while many leaders appreciate you sharing some key principles, like the principles I just shared today, what they really want to do is discuss and have ideas on how they put that learning into practice. Because leadership is hard. You know, I, I think it's Bernard Avle who says leadership is a contact sport. Mm. So there's many times you find there's not an exact playbook. Somebody can send you principles, but then when you're faced with this uncertainty, when you find all of a sudden, you know, debt exchange program has affected your ability, your income and your revenue streams. When you're faced with this person in front of you who somehow you've tried everything and you can't seem to motivate them. Those are the kinds of challenges that many times leaders are grappling with. So what we're finding is that the best type of leadership development support, maybe I won't say the best, but one of the most responsive is you share principles, create space for leaders to reflect with other peer leaders on, all right, so how have you grappled with this? How would I apply that particular principle to this reality? But also really creating time for reflection. Development and evolution as a leader comes when you have time to reflect on your practice. Mm. Too often as leaders, we're, we're under fire, you know, as managers, we're going, 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 we're just doing, doing, doing. We don't have time to reflect on, you know, these past couple of years, I've been using this particular style. I've been using this way to deal with the team. Is that really working? Is there something else I should be doing differently? Yeah? So a coach and those kinds of learning spaces help you to do that. I am tempted to say something, but I have a feeling if I do it, it will take you another, another okay. time. Ah. I will say, oh, but let me see, if okay. I don't, but not allow you to comment. Okay. If I do, okay. it will start a whole conversation. Okay. I will just hear Imagine it. Imagine who moved by cheese. Years of the goalpost shifting and you not observing. Yes. By Spencer Johnson. And then another book by John Quarter that says our iceberg is melting. Where the penguins just didn't notice that the framework they've been working with has been changing so fast. One day they wake up and their lives are under threat and they're asking, yes. is, is this a new development? Yes. What has been happening for you? Yes. Then let me go to the Bible where I operate in my other book. Yes, yes. As a pastor. And the Bible says, 
one day Samson woke up as at other times and did not realize that the Spirit of God had left him. Did it, did it leave him that very day? No, it had been leaving him for a while because of what he was doing and he yeah. did not even know. Yes. I'm going to say one sentence, just to one respond sentence. to one sentence. I knew it. In the what? spirit of uncertainty and disruption, the lesson from what you just described is pay attention and make time for reflection on your leadership and whether it's responsive to the new times. Why? So that you don't wake up and realize, my goodness, the cheese moved. A lot of the trends we're seeing, the disruptions we are seeing today around the increased role of technology, the high levels of globalization and interconnectivity are not new. They've just been accelerated. So if we as leaders start to pay a lot more attention to trends, we start to also pay attention to what they call perceptual acuity. See what's coming around the corner and reflect on our own leadership and our organizations and companies to see are we fit for purpose to what's happening then we're less disrupted by the disruptees. We become the disruptors. Talking about becoming disruptors, let's go on to the third part of yeah, the framework. Yeah. So if you have been trending with us from the beginning, Taka has been using a four-point framework to help leaders to navigate disruption. At the core of this conversation is point number one is about inform and you can never do enough of it number two is about connect build trust based on your competence and your character let's go on to point number three you mentioned guide yes tell yes, us about it yes so so what you're seeking to do under this third principle is where there is uncertainty about where is this organization going where is this company going given these changes in the market what you're doing as a leader is providing guidance through clarity, not certainty. The future rewards clarity and punishes certainty. So if you stand up, again in the spirit of informing, in front of your team and are like, all right, that's it. I know for sure we will do blah, 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 blah. I know for sure this will happen. Then chances are, given how we see things keep changing, you could be wrong and that weakens your credibility and integrity. Yeah? But if you're able to say to your team, I am crystal clear that this is where we want to go. I'm crystal clear that despite this disruption, despite this uncertainty we're facing, I see a potential opportunity for us to seize here. Hmm? Then folks feel like, okay, at least somebody knows where we're going. Because the idea is that you're giving guidance and clarity on where you're going, but always knowing you will be flexible in terms of how you get there. Hmm? So there's always agility in terms of how you get there, but you're clear about where you're going. The only thing to be certain about are your values. Wow. So you're saying that in times of uncertainty, be willing to be, be clear about what opportunities you see and the And where you would like to go, your where vision. you would like to yeah. go, but don't be bullish about what, is, what will happen because... Eggs. You, can't, you just can't predict anymore. I'll tell you what, let me use football, something that many people can relate to very easily. Yes. And I was listening to recently a sports pundit make a prediction before a match and he says, this is a done deal the team would win and he actually gave the score line by five goals to nil and he says even if it doesn't go to five the the minimum would fall nil yes, it didn't happen exactly. the team did not even win and i'm saying how do you come back at half time or full time as a pundit and if somebody played back the authority in which you said it yes and then now begin to explain that well there's the the, the fundamentals or the, the assumptions were, were flawed so you are saying be be very clear about yes. the opportunity and what yes. you want to do, but yes. make room yes. for the fact that 
So for instance, you might be very clear that you're saying, all right, with this level of disruption, we recognize, I'll give you an example of the type of business I'm in, eh? where I start to realize, okay, with our business model and given the changing CD, to survive, we need to increasingly have a market that's global. Mm -hmm. So we need to look for clients that are global. So I can be crystal clear huh, that for Busara to thrive, huh, I need an increasingly global clientele. Mm -hmm. Now, I cannot tell you for certain, and I can have some kind of targets that I'm seeking, but I cannot be for certain that this is what's going to happen in the market and this is what's going to happen in the market, but I'm very clear about where I would like my business to grow to. I can be very clear about what our strengths are and how we want to leverage those. And then going back to point number one, that's what I'm communicating. Okay. Mm -hmm. You keep saying clientele, you keep saying employees, okay. and you keep saying organizations, but okay. I can assure you that okay. anytime you say it, my mind also goes to nations because the principles oh, are that. equally applicable to that. political leadership office holders and permit me but in my mind i'm processing and saying that oh okay so based on what taka is saying if you had done this this way you would have gotten probably a better stakeholder engagement and better response oh, to what 100%. was obviously a well-intended policy or idea is that a fair percent hundred percent i mean let's go back to the beginning informing huh if you had formed informed citizens using so many different platforms, communicating with so many different types of organized citizens about, and you know, again, this is the thing, you don't wait until the end. Mm. Huh? You inform people early enough about this is the potential crisis that's arising. Huh? Let's have a lot more ideas on what needs to happen hmm, in terms of the direction. Second, is if you connect, where you're showing people. I mean, one of the things I keep hearing is people's concerns about, okay, you're t telling us to tighten our belts. You're telling us that we won't get the same return on investments. You're telling us we have to sacrifice. Show us how you truly are sacrificing. So sometimes connecting huh, in terms of demonstrating empathy is not just your words. It's your actions. And that's where the character bit comes in. Totally. How do I trust you huh? if I now have to make sacrifices, I can't have the kinds of benefits I had before, I need to cut back. I need to see that you, whether you're leaders of a nation, you are the senior management team, you're head of the church, I need to see that you make the sacrifices first. Taka, I, worry. I can't let you go on this part of the conversation without asking you about optics. Oh, How yes. important are optics? 100% because it's back to how do you inform. Huh? You know, we think many times as leaders, we think others know what we're doing. Huh? But when you're sensitive to what those you are leading are going through, you pay attention to optics that demonstrate either care or not caring. Because often, as they often say, this is the usual common, very common adage, actions speak louder than words. Hmm? So what are the optics showing in terms of what you're doing, in terms of connecting, demonstrating empathy, that you're trustworthy, that you have clarity in terms of where you're moving to? So for the benefit of, and, and I'm borrowing from your idea about explaining things in a way that everyone can understand mm. so for the benefit of somebody listening and seeing what is optics i'm just i'm just trying to rehash your point you are saying yes. that for a leader who is trying to communicate to your people that times are tough and we are facing an unprecedented disruption there must not be pictures and videos floating around of you having a big party and celebrating. Driving in huge cars, okay. you know. It's, and, and, and we have to think in terms of the people that we lead and how we understand them. Huh? What are the optics? You know, optics will be different in different contexts. In terms of, and when we mean the optics, what is the picture that people see of you? that communicates that you have asked them to sacrifice, but you, and get my word again, you first, I always say, leadership, we model the way. So we're saying if all of us have to cut back in order to manage this crisis we find ourselves in, it means we first have to take action. 
I want to come to the last point on Unite, but there's something that is back okay. in my yes. mind. Yes. Taka, yes. let me ask you about respect. Ooh. Based on optics, based on information, Ooh. based on communication. Let's l help me distill people's perception about respect based on how the leader communicates. Hmm. You said how the leader communicates, but it's more than that. Okay. You communicate or you indicate how much you respect those that you are leading, not so much on what you say. What you say matters, yes. But it's what you do mm. that truly matters in terms of communicating respect. So, during times of uncertainty, how do I demonstrate my respect for those who I'm leading? Number one, I listen. So part of the informing, I should have also said, is not a one-way street where I come and talk at you. Huh? where there's room to get ideas, huh? where it's important to get others. Because increasingly leadership, again, one of the big shifts around leadership, it's not about one person. It's increasingly about distributed leadership. Huh? So the first thing is by listening, having a two-way communication. That shows respect. Mm. The other way I show respect is back to the issue of the, the, the optics. Huh? I don't ask you to sacrifice that which I am not willing to sacrifice. In other words, I never ask you to do that which I don't do. That shows respect, particularly if we have certain values we claim we're all about. I demonstrate them first. I don't ask you to, I'm not going to hold you accountable unless I'm holding myself accountable. That demonstrates respect. Huh? The third thing to demonstrate respect is I get feedback from you and I pay attention. You see me shifting based on the feedback. Huh? If I'm leading you, Albert, and, and you give me feedback about, you know, Taka, this decision that you took, and you're fine, it, it's not working out for me. And I'm like, yeah, 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 but just continue doing something else. And I'm like, and, and doing something else, I'm not coming back to me. It's not to say every leader, you have to say yes, yes, yes to all the feedback, but not coming back to me to clearly state, all right, I've heard you and owning up this one, I admit you're right and I've made a mistake. This one, I... I can't go with what you're suggesting because of one, reason. two, three. Huh? That shows respect. And I always say, if you are leading without respect or love, often you're really not leading. You're just doing something and people are following you because they have no choice. So the first one is listening. The second one is the optics or leadership by example. Yes. The third one is feedback. Yes. And the yes. fourth is... I would say those are three. I think to me, those are three ways of showing respect. Wonderful. Let's settle on the final point in this framework. And before that, you must promise to come back again. Yes, we'll, we'll would love to, would love book. to. But let's do something about uniting people. Yes. It's so big, so, oh, yes. so big. I must confess that especially for the times in which we live, scan the corporate environment, Different schools of thought, different factions, count the national leadership landscape divided right through the middle, enter any kind of organization, and you will find that there sometimes are so many polarized That's groupings it. in thought and in practice. That's it. How big is uniting people and how does it work? Huge, because we find uncertain times are divisive times. Because when people are uncertain and afraid and anxious, they start to get together into their small little groups because there's competition. Hmm? Immediately people perceive there's competition. So it's like, oh my goodness, it's me against you and there's this and that. And then you find in those kinds of environments which can become toxic very quickly, eh? you find the quietest, the less powerful, the ones with less voice, tend to lose. So they're not only the most divisive, they can also be the less inclusive or more exclusionary spaces. So what do we do as a leader? The, the first is to name it, huh? to, to not foster at all. You have to pay close attention to your decision making so that it doesn't look like you're favoring one group or another. 
we really pay close attention to equity and equitable opportunities, eh? because those are the kinds of things that make people feel one or the other. The, the second is, if you're particularly talking about organizational leadership, you find ways to bring people together in teams, cross-functional teams, eh? or if it, you're talking about a community, eh? it's teams from different factions to help solve the problem to help seize the opportunity that uncertainty is bringing about. Huh? So it's almost like I'm saying like, you know, when you get people busy working together, you're already signaling to them that part of our way of thriving during the uncertainty is by coming together. And you keep singing the song about coming together. You tell stories about, you, give, you tell stories and narratives that weave a theme about this is the thing that unites us as a people, as a company, as a church, as a community. When you tell those stories, people start to feel like, okay, maybe I'm not so alone. To weather this storm, this uncertainty, we have to stick together. That becomes a key part of your, your narrative. Those are ways that one unites during uncertainty. So if you want... Your, your key takeouts based on the framework you've worked with, it will definitely be the four points, inform, connect, and then guide, and then unite. unite. Which is your favorite, Saka? Oh, nice one. Connect. Why? I find when you connect with another person from your soul as a human being, as a leader, that's when the true leadership comes out. Mm? Because then you are inviting, to me leadership ultimately is bringing out the best in another person to realize a particular goal. It's not using a person to get something done, it's bringing out the very best. And when you connect with them as human being to human being, that's when you can see their true potential to weather all uncertainty. True leadership is about bringing out the best in someone to achieve a particular goal. It's not about using them. And the best way to do that is to connect with the people. Mm -hmm. Let me summarize the thoughts of Taka. So when I come back, I'm going to ask <laughs> Taka to give everyone who is battling in their own unique way a word of encouragement. Everyone needs encouragement at a time like this. Something to inspire you to, to soldier on with confidence with hope and with trust so the points i have garnered from this conversation 15 of them took our number one is about the african narrative there's mm. enough of bashing of africa let's model let's throw light on the best of ourselves to inspire mm. even more of that number two is about the universality of the challenges facing business people not just in some part of the mm -hmm. world all over the world they are the same uncertain challenges the third one is the first point in your framework and you say inform and there can never be something like over communication. You must keep doing it and doing it in different ways and different styles. Mm -hmm. The fourth is the second point in the framework about connection, your favorite. And you're saying that mm -hmm. in moments of uncertainty, people don't listen logically. Connect to them through emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and build trust first by your competence which is required yes. and then by your your character, character which is non-negotiable yes. and that refers to the alignment with the stated values yes. then he went on to the fifth point about vulnerability he says forget about the old perception of that strong macho unshakable leader admit your own fears and vulnerability but in the same port demonstrate inner resilience like the mandela in the plane with the turbulence <laughs> the sixth was about managing yourself if you can't manage yourself you can't manage others and very often that's why we don't do what we ought to do that is so evident the seventh is about power skills she says don't even call them soft skills they are critical tools needed by leaders and very often ignored in our developmental path and she says that must be part of the investment then you go on to informal learning as point number eight and you say while many leaders appreciate the lessons they want practical ways in which they can apply them to so share the principle 
create shared conversations with others going through similar things and then provide moments for reflection. The point number nine is about reflection. She says that in times of uncertainty, pay attention and reflect on what you are doing to ensure that you don't wake up one day and that Jesus is totally gone. <laughs> number 10 is about the, the, the third point in the framework on guide. You see, provide clarity because the future rewards clarity but punishes certainty. So be clear about where you are going, but don't be bullish about your predictions and then come back to Iswalu Humble <laughs> Pipe. The, 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 the 11th is about optics. She says it is absolutely critical to be sensitive to the people you are leading and the picture you are painting to them about whether you can be trusted mm. and whether you relate to who they are and where they are. Then you go on to number 12, respect. And you see, that is based not just on what you see, but on what you do. Listening, leading by example, and valuing feedback. 13 is about the, the, the last point on the framework, which is unite people. And you say divisive or uncertain times are divisive times. Yes. When people are threatened, they form groups based on a perception of competition. And that can be very divisive. <laughs> and your language and everything must focus on uniting people. The fourth thing is about decision making. In trying to unite people, pay attention to your decision making and to equity to ensure that people are brought together in cross-functional teams that don't seem to lean in one direction but bring people together to work towards the goal. And then the final one, true leadership is bringing out the best in people in achieving a particular goal. And that comes by what? Wow. wow. <laughs> that comes by? It's just... It's just... Yeah, that summary was amazing. Just yeah, we should write a book with this. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening. I'm like, did we come out with all of that? Yes. Look into this camera and speak to somebody who's saying, oh, I love this. This is an hour. It's like a place of refuge. This past hour has given me something to look forward to, something mm. to hope for. Because truly, that's what we seek to do with a mm. platform like this. Mm. Speak to people going through their daily challenges mm. and seeing by the sharing of these principles, you should be empowered to believe and to move forward. Taka, mm. give us a minute of inspiration to somebody listening to you and saying, this is it, this is it. There you go. You know, you know, today we've talked a lot about leaders, but we need to emphasize that everybody listening to this show is a leader. Leadership is not about a title. And leadership really starts with you taking leadership of your own life. In the midst of uncertainty, turmoil, and storms, it's grounding yourself, believing in yourself, and determining what is that one little thing I can do that demonstrates my belief in myself and my ability to move forward? So don't wait for others to fix everything. Start today with you. Your leadership today starts with your ability to lead you today. Once you lead yourself, you can, you lead. can lead another. Check out where we have another date coming up. Coming yes, up soon. my pleasure. Back on Springboard oh, Adventure pleasure. University. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so amazing. much for I've having loved me. This. Oh, I'm humbled. I absolutely had a wonderful time. Yeah, you had I'll be back. I'll Let's be back. Do this again. <laughs> so, this has been an, an electric edition of Springboard, your virtual investing with Taka Awari, just splitting leadership like somebody with a pickaxe. And let me once again recommend her book. We love African writings here and we make a deliberate effort to promote. Um, book Nook Virtual, they can deliver book Nook to is you. Book regular here. Oh, so okay, so yes, Book, book Nook. You can All also right. go onto my website, taka.awari, and we can have a book delivered to you. So go to Airport Shell, go to taka.awari, go to booknook.com, or call them on their hotline, and then you will find the book by Taka Awari. So we come away again on Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran, thanking you on behalf of Team Springboard and our sponsors, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, MTN Pulse, and our media partners, the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Business. So let's say once again, God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you.